Okay. Um, what we want to talk about today is raceline optimization. First of all, um, this is very uh, heavily inspired from my, my previous university. So the course material and the content you will see today is um, inspired by them and therefore the acknowledgement goes to them. So what we want to do today is first of all, talk about like, what is a race line? Uh, what can you understand when you hear race line? Um, how to get track data? Because that's what you need in your final race, for example, or even in the ICRA race. Then I show you one example we go in detail today how we optimize regarding a race line. And then I will show you one final example that everybody knows. Um, I show you how to race in Levine Hall with a very fast race line. So the first thing we're doing today is like, what is a race line? Okay. So what do you understand when you hear race line? What does it mean? Because when you're like watching Formula One, you see the car is, for example, not driving on the far left, it's not driving on the far right, it's even not driving in the center. It's driving a special line, which we call the race line. And per definition, it is the fastest line around the track. So again, that's per definition. How you obtain to be the fastest car around the track, it's, it's up to you, right? And when you see, for example, here on the right side, that's a comparison between two lines. And a line or like the race line is, has have, is having like four um, points that are very, very important. The first one is the breaking point. It's like you need to define when to break. If you miss that point, like you overshoot, what happens? The car is, yeah, going out of the track and crashing. If you miss that point too early, you're going too slow into the turn and you're not fast enough. Then number two is the turn in point. Like when do you start to actually turn in your car? And that heavily defines the apex. For example, you see here, we have an early apex in the orange line. And we have the late apex in the blue line. And then you accelerate the car again. And for example, in that case, the race line would look like the blue line and not like the orange line. In addition here, this race line heavily depends on your driving style. Like uh, Lewis Hamilton is having a different race line than uh, Sebastian Vettel because first of all, your driving style is heavily depending on the car you're using and the setup. For example, if you have like an understeering car, you need to access this turn um, a little bit differently than with an oversteering car. And what you don't see here right now is what I just show you here is one turn. This race line heavily depends on what comes afterwards. So what you see here, for example, is a race line that is having a straight afterwards, okay? So we're having this late apex because we accelerate later and then take the speed all along this, this race line, okay? For example, the, the slow line, what you see here, would be that we have afterwards the next turn either to the left or to the right, okay? So this line depends. And we call it, therefore, global optimal race line planning because we're looking at the track as a whole and try to figure out what is the fastest line around the racetrack. And again, our goal here, to drive as fast as possible. And how do we achieve that or how do we determine that is up to us. So the problem we are solving today is like how to obtain this race line. And the methods we are showing you today are heavily in the field of optimization. And what you learn today and what you implement and what you will use afterwards is the so-called minimum curvature optimization. So the first thing or one thing, just as a preliminary, um, in the lectures where we talked about planning, we probably came up with the turns of the path and the trajectory. In my term and what mostly robotics research and autonomous driving research is used is like a trajectory is always a path plus a velocity profile. And a path is just X and Y points and heading, okay? Just so everybody's aware. Because why I'm showing this to you is that you can focus on both of them, okay? So just because you have a path doesn't mean you drive fast around this path. And you can literally imagine like, you can drive here with like five meters per second, or 50 meters per second, okay? So just because you have the pass doesn't mean you're driving fast on this. Therefore, we are separating this two. 
Um, the first thing we want to do today is like, how do you actually get track data? And how do you actually get something that is on the, from the left, like an image of the track? You probably have seen such an image before when you watch a race, you get such an image to see like, okay, how do I get from the left image to the right image where you see a blue line that shows you the actual race line? How do we do that? So the first thing you can do, just open Google Maps, download this image and do some um, computer vision with it because the track or the what we used here is open street maps gives you a very good representation of the track layout of course this is not super accurate right you understand it's like probably we miss a few centimeters or probably like 10 centimeters but it gives you first of all the track layout it gives you a very good representation of the layout and it gives you a good track width that's what you need in the end. And as, as last but not least, the center line, that's what we're working with. So you can just obtain, like for example, we set up the track here, just make an image, do some computer vision, have the right resolutions, and then you get your track data. But in your case, because you're working with the F110's car and you're working with a 2D LiDAR, you take the track map you created in ROS or Arvis, what you visualize, and do some additional refinements with that. Because what we want to have in the end, in our case, like what I teach you today, is the center line, which means the X and Y points that define the center line of this racetrack. So how you can do that? You get the LiDAR data of your racetrack, you do some yeah, refinements with it, you do some post-processing, and there's an algorithm, I think it's called watershed algorithm, where you like start from the left and start from the right and try to figure out where the middle is. And based on this algorithm, you can create your X and Y points of the center line. That's just like one technology on how you can use that. You can use different algorithms too to create this um, kind of center line. But in the end, we want to have this information here, like where are the X and Y points? And in addition, what is the distance to the left bound and to the right bound? And that's all you need basically to define your track. Because when you look at this and you look at all these points on the racetracks, if you have the X and Y coordinate here and the distance to the left and distance to the right, you can basically define your complete track and you have the layout. So basically what I show you today, that is what you need. You don't need anything more. Of course, you can do that completely differently if you have a different approach. But in our approach here, we are focusing on the center line with the distance to the left and the distance to the right. Um, of course, um, we provided a little bit uh, material for you. So on the F110's GitHub, you find a repository that currently includes 20 racetracks from all over the world. For example, you see here Silverstone on the right, you see Sark here, you see a German track, you see Austin in Texas, everything downscaled to one to 10, and you could race directly with it um, with your F110's car in the simulation, of course. And what these racetrack database includes is first of all, the center line and the race line already. So if you wanna try out a, a few things for your algorithms, for example, for the car, you can do that with that racetrack database. Okay, are there any questions for the um, center line generation or generally understanding questions on what we're doing here? Because now we are moving on to really create the race line. That's what we want to achieve because we want to know what is the global optimal path around the track for our given car. That's, that's our goal, okay? So we don't have a race driver. We don't have Lewis Hamilton. Our race driver is our software. Okay, it's up to us to optimize the software, but we need to give that some software something which it can rely on, like it's global optimal path. And that's what we try to create here. Again, global optimal trajectory is heavily depending on the vehicle dynamics, which means if you drive with the F110's car in a tuned version, for example, you tune up your velocity, it has different vehicle dynamics. And again here, please remember lecture five, uh, six. You can have a look here and just remember what the vehicle dynamics were and why different speeds lead to different accelerations on the vehicle. And what we're not doing here is like having this high level navigation planning, okay? We don't use that race line to actually say, oh, by the way, that's like, here's the end goal and it's where you drive. It's just like for us, the X and Y points and the velocity 
we give our car and therefore our car always knows whatever it does if i go back to this line i'm as fast as possible as i can get from a theoretical perspective and that's the most important slide for today and i can just repeat that again and again and again again optimality is our definition okay what we define as optimality is up to us and we can vary this definition heavily there are three main um, definitions which are commonly used and the first one everybody has heard shortest path is like the so-called dijkstra algorithm okay we just optimize and combine therefore we travel the the least meters so and if you look on the right side how this blue line looks you see it's like heavily sticking to the inside of the racetrack and if you for example look from turn two to turn three you see that we are directly crossing the the the, the lane so therefore we're traveling the least meters okay i think everybody understands that um that's very easy but if you just look at it is that the fastest line probably no okay and you're right it's not the fastest line so the second term we are coming up with is the green one. And this one is called minimum curvature. So minimum curvature sounds fancy, but more or less, think about that you steer with your car. And what we do now is we minimize your steering, either to the left, to the right, your number of steering actions. And what we basically do, we, when we drive with your car into a turn, we try to optimize to one peak, and then go back directly. This implies that we are driving with the car to a peak acceleration. We hit that peak acceleration of our car and then go back. And therefore we incorporate the vehicle dynamics, simplified, but we do it, and we minimize the steering. And with a minimum curvature, you get a race line looking at something like this. And I think everybody agrees here that looks what we know from the race car, right? We're coming to the outside, taking the turn on the outside, go to the inside, cross here, stay on the outside, go back inside. That's something which is like, yeah, probably everybody has seen before. Okay, so minimum curvature is number two we can do. And number three is also probably something you have heard in another term is called optimal control. And another term for that is the minimum time optimization. So what we're doing here now, we create a much bigger optimization problem and we optimize for the control actions of the car, which means we optimize the acceleration and we optimize the steering of the car and we do everything based on a very sophisticated vehicle dynamics um, model we use in this optimization problem. So you can think about that we are from here, from the shortest path to minimum curvature to minimum time, we increase the complexity of this optimization, number one. We increase the model complexity because we are getting more sophisticated, but we also increase the quality of the output. And ultimately, the, if we have a minimum time, if we optimize for the shortest time, for the fastest lap time, this implies we have the fastest car, okay? And because we're taking care of all the vehicle dynamics, this should be, from an optimization point of view, our best and global optimal race line, and that's the one we want to follow. Okay, so if you look in the literature, you probably find minimum curvature and minimum time. Um, that's what we're focusing on. And today I will show you um, explicitly how minimum curvature works and what you can understand for that. And minimum time is something a little bit bigger. Um, we probably do in some additional discussion, I will show you in the end. Um, so how are we getting our minimum curvature? In our case, we are splitting the path planning and the velocity planning, which means in the first step, we just take care about the path, okay? We try to figure out what is the minimum curvature path. Then we use that path, re-optimize everything again, or like recalculate everything again, and get a velocity profile that fits to this path. So what happens here, we are decoupling our problem. This gives us the possibility that we are faster, simplified, and, Again, for our car, for our F110's car, probably enough, good enough to drive fast. But we are missing here, for example, couple defects. We are decoupling velocity profile and path playing, and that's what I said to you in the beginning. It's not a good idea because we are not as fast as enough, but in our case, it's probably good enough. And I can give you a number, it's like 5% good enough, okay? 5% to the minimum time. 
That's what you get as a difference. We break 5% faster, or sometimes from a minimum time perspective, even slower, but minimum time gives us the more accurate one. Okay? But in our case, totally fine enough. And I can guarantee you it's fine enough because I used that for the big race cars and it worked out pretty good. Okay. Um, so what we are doing in that case is that we are using quadratic programming or a quadratic optimization problem. And you, everybody heard about optimization. First of all, we define an objective function. In our objective or in a quadratic problem, it has a quadratic problem formulation or quadratic function integrated. And what we're doing here, we're finding the vector x that optimizes our problem. Of course, we then have constraints. We have the boundaries, upper boundaries, lower boundaries. So we define our problem here. But in that case, what you need to understand, minimum curvature, we're using a quadratic optimization problem. So when we start with the pass planning, the first thing you do, you get the center line I just provided to you, OK? All the points that define the racetracks and the lengths to the width, uh, the width to the left, and the width to the right. And what we are now doing, and that is where like all this magic happens, think about all these points. And now what we do in this optimization, we try to shift them either to the, to the upper side or to the lower side. So our blue point is now our center line. And now we think, OK, maybe in that turn, what happens, this point here needs to go a little bit more to the inside. And this upper point, point here needs to go a little bit to the outside. So Basically, what we're doing now, we just shift the geometrics of the center line, okay? We know the center line and its width, and now we're just shifting the point. That's everything we're doing here. And we're doing that because we can move our points on the normals to the, to the north or to the south or to, like to the up and to the down. And that's basically the magic. That's basically everything we do, geometrical optimization, but that helps us to get um, the race line. And we have this, this um, uh, alpha here as like a main shifting point or like as a main scale factor for shifting these variables here. So what we're doing to achieve that, and now we go a little bit more into the depths. The first thing we do is we create a curvature continuous spline. So in one of the lectures previous, we, we taught you that we have like different continuity, Z0, Z1, Z2. In our case, the second derivative, which defines the curvature, needs to be continuous, which means I have two points. And when I have a curvature here, I want to have the same curvature here. So the continuity must be given. That's what we are taking care of. And that's why, in our case, we're having cubic polynomial splines. splines and that's what we're using to combine all these points. So from our center line, from all these points, we create now polynomials, and we do that for both the x points and the y points, OK? So this here, for example, is our x point on, for example, the first, first um, uh, center line point, OK? Our first center line point, we're now only taking care of x. And our x point is defined by this cubic polynomial. We take the first derivative, we take the second derivative, and we have now all the functions that define our x position in a geometrical way on the racetrack. That's everything, OK? When we repeat that, we do that again for the y point. And now we have x and y defined as a cubic polynomial with the first and second derivative. Now we create our boundaries. And for example, in our case, we say, oh, by the way, the start of the spline should be placed on a current discretization point, clear. The end of the spline should be placed on a subsequent discretization point. Also clear, we're not choosing like number two. We just used the number, number one here. The heading continuity at the end of the spline should be equal to the heading at the beginning of the next spline. Also clear. We don't want to like on this point have a heading of like pi and then here minus pi and like looking at a different direction should be the same. And then finally, the curvature. OK, the curvature at the end of the spline should be equal to the curvature at the beginning of the next spline. And therefore, we create here in this part this continuous behavior. That's what we want to achieve. OK, I just repeat. We have these center line points. We define x and y. We define that with our cubic polynomials so we can write them down. 
And what we finally then get is these boundaries. We convert all these boundaries also in equations. And then, and that's the final point for, for this uh, definition, we define our curvature. So everything I just showed you, x and y, first derivative, second derivative, we put everything in this equation here, and that's what defines our curvature. And that's what, that's our optimization goal, right? Minimum curvature. So what we want to do now is optimize this curvature with this function here. And therefore, what you see here, we have like a curvature that goes to the left and to the right um, um, with like um, below zero and above zero. And that defines then our behavior. And finally, that's our optimization problem. Optimizing this function based on the X and Y points, based on the first and second derivatives, based on the curvature and the heading. And optimizing everything gives you then the optimal race line. And now I want to show you something um, that gives us like the first output. So we run this algorithm and optimize for it. And for example, what you see, if we linearize and optimize along the reference line, we get the blue area. And that looks kind of a little bit of sketchy, okay? So you optimize only once, then you get like the blue line. And what we figured out that you have to repeat or warm start this problem with this already uh, optimized curvature. If you repeat that many times, like for five, six, seven times, you get an even better result because of the warm start and because of the linearization errors. And for example, you see that even after the optimization, we can additionally re-optimize this curvature again. And what you see as an output is then like either like the blue or the orange line, in our case, the orange line. And that's now curvature optimal path, the curvature optimal X and Y points around the racetrack. Okay, that's basically it. I, I just repeat, we have the center line, we shift the points on the center line by defining their X and Y positions as a cubic polynomial. We put everything in a curvature definition and we minimize for the curvature and therefore the steering of the car, we minimize the steering input, we minimize the steering and maximize to one point, then go down with the steering again and therefore create something that looks like that. That's curvature optimal. Okay, now we have our path defined, um, but we still don't know how fast can we drive on this path. So what we need to do now is create a velocity profile that fits to this path. How are we doing that? There's like also many opportunities you can do that. The one I will show you today is the easiest one is the so-called forward backward solver. Um, you find that online too, you find functionalities for that. What you also can do is like optimization. There's a, a tool or like a functionality called SpeedOpt uh, from Stanford, which is like very popular, which means you need to optimize again. In our case, it's a little bit too much because we can do that much faster and much easier. And that's the so-called forward backward solver. So this one is like fast, accurate, and less complicated and uses simplified vehicle dynamics. And that's what we want to do. So what defines a fast car? Basically, and remember lecture number six, the tires and the car setup. So how fast can I drive on a straight is defined by the longitudinal acceleration, is defined by your tires and is defined by your engine of the car. Okay, so if you have a more powerful uh, engine and better tires, you can accelerate much faster on a straight or in longitudinal direction. And how fast can you drive around a turn, around the corner, is defined by your lateral acceleration. And this is heavily depending on the tires you have. Just remember lecture number six, where I showed you the tire dynamics behavior, that's where this comes into account. And the lateral acceleration can be easily calculated with this function here is the velocity squared multiplied by the curvature. And that's what we defined already. And we have an optimal curvature now, which means we know how fast can we drive on one turn if we know the maximum lateral acceleration. So and now comes the price question. What is the maximum acceleration of your car? So how do you know that? How do you get that? Okay. So for f on tens, you can ask Billy on me. Um, but what you also can do, you just do some experiments and let the car drive and just spin the car around, drive on a certain velocity. 
And then you get a simplified version of the so-called friction limits or a so-called GG diagram, which defines maximum and longitudinal acceleration. Again, simplified version. What you see in orange here, so-called friction circle, which is heavily defined by the tires. Okay, so um, normally this one is called the CAM circle after Mr. CAM, who defined that circle. And normally it doesn't look like a circle itself. It's like a little bit flattened out. It's going a little bit more down to the uh, deceleration because your car can break or it can, can have more negative acceleration than positive acceleration. But this is the simplified version. And if you capture that behavior, you get a maximum lateral dynamics and a lateral longitudinal dynamics. And that's all you need, okay? Because if you go back to this function, uh, function here, you just use your curvature at one given point, calculate with the speed and see if that exceeds the lateral acceleration or not. And then you know how fast you can drive. <laughs> easy as it is, of course, it's simplified. So for example, you think, oh, the f tense car can drive 10 meters per second squared. Then you drive with a, a speed and then, yeah, based on the friction, you exceed the acceleration and there you go, your car is crashing, okay? So um, a personal recommendation here, if you think your car can drive 10 meters per second squared, let your car drive eight meters per second squared. Just go a little bit lower. Um, what we're doing now is the so-called forward backward solver. And with the forward backward solver, it's a pretty easy setup. Um, you can write that in code very quickly. What we do now, we go along the curvature, one time from the front and one time from the back. And we just try to figure out what is the maximum acceleration we can drive from this point. There are basically uh, four steps we need to do here. The first one, we get a velocity profile estimated based on the maximum possible lateral acceleration. what I just explained to you. We have this maximum lateral acceleration. We know this number. Somehow experimental, we got it. It's like 10 meters per second square. So we use it in our formula at one point and say maximum velocity 10 meters per second. So we use that one. And then we cut our profile where the velocity is above this limit because for example, we could exceed it. And then we loop through these discretization points one time from the front and one time from the back. And that's where we find our sweet spot of the velocity profile. And what we do with this forward backward is first of all, in these step three and four, we derive the velocity in the next discretization point by calculating the velocity, first of all, in lateral acceleration, and then, and that's where the magic happens here, the remaining potential for the longitudinal acceleration, okay? So we figured out that we can drive this certain lateral acceleration, and we see if we can even accelerate or decelerate a little bit more. That's what we're doing here. And therefore, everything comes together in one sweet spot where we say, oh, by the way, based on all these simplified calculations we have, I tell you, you can drive 9.5 meters per second. And that's the velocity you get in the end. And it looks similar to something like this here. This is both the same velocity profile, but one it's flipped, okay? That's our, in reality, what we do now is here the, the, um, the deceleration of the car. And what we do now is in the forward calculation, yeah, it's just what I explained. We go through the steps, we calculate the velocity, uh, we calculate the acceleration in lateral, we calculate the acceleration in longitudinal, and then we define the velocity we have in the end. So basically, we just loop through our curvature profile with these dynamic equations until we find the speed spot where, um, where, the, where both of them met. And then we have our velocity profile defined. Okay, that was now a little bit more theory. Now let's just go into one example that you can see how that looks like. So this is Levine Hall. Everybody raced there. You raced there with different algorithms. You raced there with the gap follower or follow the gap, the wall follower. You raced there with your own algorithm. And probably all of you defined something like this, right? Looked a little bit different. Looked a little bit, yeah, sometimes probably not that smooth. But that's what everybody, I think, can agree on. I hope so. Um, but is that really the, the profile we want? Okay. Everything I told you now, we put in this algorithm. We have provided that for you. And we optimize, okay? So first of all, we optimize shortest path. 
that runs in a second because it's a very small map. And shortest path says for us, we get a lap time of 10 seconds. Shortest path, okay? So we stick to the inside and then go around that. Then the minimum curvature I just explained to you would give me an output of 8.94 seconds, which is like very, very fast, like six seconds faster than we had in our race. And now the super heavy minimum time optimization, which takes the vehicle dynamics into account and everything, tells me 9.61 seconds. So half a second slower than this one, but obviously more accurate. I just showed you the parameters I used here. I, um, I said the car can drive 12 meters per second as a maximum velocity. And in lateral and longitudinal, we can stand 12 meters per second squared. So obviously these numbers are very, very high. And probably we do not take care about the friction and we do not take care about if the car can actually drive that. But I said, these numbers are doable, okay? From my point of view. And then I get the 8.94 seconds. So when we put everything in this algorithm I showed you, we get a profile that looks like this, okay? In black, you have the inner bounds and outer bounds of Levine Hall. Here's our lab. That's where we were standing and waiting for everybody with the car. And what you see here in red, that's the center of gravity of the car. And probably I think this is a very easy setup. Everybody can agree on that because what you see here, the car is staying on the outside, of course, then taking all its velocity into the turn, driving very smooth and almost hitting the wall on the other side again and just repeating that because it's symmetrical, okay? So we're doing that all the time. And that based on this minimum curvature, that's how this race line would look like. And I think everybody can agree on that, that that's probably is like the fastest way around the track. Okay, again, that's just the path. We can drive there with one meters per second or with 20, whatever we think of. In our case, it's a maximum of 12 meters per second. And the velocity profile looks like this. Just again, that's where we were standing. That's the area where we were standing. So what do you see here? That the car starts accelerating. That's all the green points right after the exit. Um, accelerating, slowing down very heavily, so the car is braking. I think I explained it a few to you that in our car, we do not have like this braking currently uh, implied or, or active, but the car, what it's doing here is heavily braking, going a little bit slower through the corner, accelerating here again, and then repeating everything on the other side. Okay, just repeat myself. Based on everything I just showed you, based on this minimum curvature, based on this forward backward solver, that's what in an optimal case, the car behaviors would look like. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what do you mean with not symmetric? I think that's just like, that's just looking like that. It's just a little bit flip. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just have to check in with that again. Yeah, it might be where it starts. Like, it's just one lap. Maybe, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what I just want to say. I think it's not kind of symmetrical here. That's what you say, you see, basically, based on the, this behavior. Huh? Oh, yet now I see, yeah, you're right, yeah. Again, it's very important to see that this one implies that the car is actively braking, that we have this negative acceleration, so the car is slowing down. Okay, um, 
that's basically from my side. Um, if you want to read about more about that, I just put the, the link of the paper inside. You can read about that. It has some nice graphics in it. What I, what I really wanted to do is like, if somebody of you wants to try that out, I can hand over uh, this race line and the team that does that and gives me a good evaluation why it's working and not gets a beer from me. And the team that hits the 110 seconds I invite for dinner. Okay, so if somebody wants to do that, I can just um, put the race line on Piazza. Um, of course, there's a likely chance that you crash your car. Maybe you do that afterwards. <laughs> um, but that's my uh, incentive for having a look at the race line. Thank you very much for listening today. And yeah, if there are questions, we can discuss that. Yeah, thank you.